Good afternoon, everybody, for our second uh, keynote in this uh, conference. This afternoon, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce you Amy Raymond Snyder, who is a professor of history at Brown University, and uh, who, as you may know, holds a large underground from Harvard, Cambridge, Paris, Ecole des Institutes en Sciences Sociales, Anna Berkeley. In uh, her first book, Remembering, Remembering King's Past, Monastic Foundation Legends in Medieval Southern France, she focused on French monastic culture and collective memory. She then retrained herself as an Iberianist and published a book that spanned the Atlantic, placing medieval Iberia in dialogue with colonial Mexico by exploring the Virgin uh, Mary as a symbol of conquest and uh, conversion. The name uh, La Conquistadora, the Virgin Mary at war and peace in the old and new worlds. A practitioner of engaged scholarship, she is a co-editor of the volume Why the Middle Ages, uh, the Middle Ages sorry, Matter, Medieval Light on Modern Injustice, and is the founder and director of the Brown History Education Prison uh, Project. She has held many research fellowships, including the most recently at the American Academy in Berlin. Her honors include the Van Corlan Elliott Prize from the uh, Medieval Academy of America and Bronze William McLaughlin Award for Teaching Excellence. Her current book uh, project is a long durée maritime microhistory of Lampedusa. And she will uh, talk right now about the, the restless Mediterranean a sea in motion. Thank you, Rosera, and thank you, Rosera, for the invitation, and thanks to the Society for the invitation as well. Um, so let's see, if my PowerPoint could be up, that would be wonderful. There we go, excellent. So this talk, like this whole conference, is dedicated to the memory of Simon Barton, whom you see here in an image used in his obituary in the Guardian, um, in the Guardian newspaper. Simon was a generous, warm, and witty man and an exemplary colleague. And I think his loss is felt especially keenly by everybody in this room who was lucky enough to count him, not just as a colleague, but also as a friend, which I did. And I also think it's appropriate that the image of Simon says the guardian, because those of us who knew him know that Simon was very much a guardian a guardian of integrity, of scholarly excellence, of his students, and of his friends. Simon doubtless would have liked this conference's theme because he himself had thought about Mediterranean mobility, as in his article about Christian Iberian warriors who crossed the sea to serve as mercenaries for North African rulers. Simon himself moved across seas, whether from the, the English Channel as he was traveling from the UK to Spain, or later across the Atlantic once he took up his position in Florida where this image was taken. Now Simon, of course, made his many sea crossings by air, as most of us do these days, or at least most scholars do. But had he traveled by water, like his medieval mercenaries, he would have had a very different experience an experience that might have shared something with the form of movement that along with tourism constitutes contemporary hypermobility in the Mediterranean, and that is mass migration. Of the many forces that determine the fate of migrants attempting Mediterranean crossings today, the Mediterranean Sea itself is paramount. Its currents, its winds, its waves, and its rocks. The ways that the sea looms large in the, these mobile people's experience illuminates aspects of pre-modern Mediterranean maritime mobility. And this is a connection that I'm exploring in my current book project. 
As Rosaire mentioned, I'm writing a long durée maritime microhistory of Lampedusa, which brings together past and present to explore this tiny Mediterranean island's importance to mobile people now, that is migrants, some approximately half a million of whom have passed through Lampedusa, which is a tiny, tiny place since the 1990s, 40 more, 41 more recently, just in the last couple of days. And I'm also exploring this island's outsized importance to mobile people between 1200 and 1700. That is, Muslim and Christian pirates and their victims, that is, captives. I'm using Lampedusa to write a new history of deserted islands, because it was deserted in the period I'm looking at it and also to explore mariners' religion, and also to illuminate dark corners of the somber history of Mediterranean seaborne violence, a violence that married piracy, captivity, religious antagonism, and religious entanglement between Muslims and Christians. Now this research has taught me that the Mediterranean as a living marine environment mediated and dominated the relationship that these mobile people of the past had with the island, much as it does today. And so what you see here today, a storm off Lampedusa, a storm that has capsized boats in the harbor, and then the famous boat cemetery, which was wrecked migrants' boats. The boat cemetery is no longer on the island. Therefore, I think that the pre-modern seafarers who visited Lampedusa would have agreed with the advice that a 15th century shipmaster, Ahmad ibn Majid, gave in his manual of instruction for mariners. He wrote, know, O reader, that sailing the sea has many principles. You should know all the coasts and their various guides, such as mud or grass, animals or fish, sea snakes and winds. You should consider the tides and the sea currents and the islands on every route. Now, Ibn Majid captained ships in the Red Sea and in the Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean in the 15th century. But Muslim, Christian, and Jewish seafarers in the medieval Mediterranean also knew that they ignored the marine environment at their peril. Medievalists, however, with a very, very few, very, very recent exceptions, including a book just edited and published by Rosaire, and she did not pay me to advertise her book, um, but you can find it downstairs for the reasonable price of 22 euros. Um, <laughs> Mostly, I think that medievalists, we really have yet to reckon with, with, as I say, a few exceptions, the importance of the sea's physicality for the mobile people that we study. The major exception to this, along with Rosaire's book and a few other volumes, very recent volumes, is the voluminous scholarship on nautical technology. Because the point of nautical technology is to produce vessels that can work with, confront, and survive the sea's physical demands. And some of that work has been presented at this conference. Medievalists are actually not alone in this neglect of the sea qua sea. Oddly, much of the research resulting from what is variously called the new maritime history or the oceanic turn or thalassography really confines salt water to a supporting role. It is true that taking a sea view has led to new histories of religion, politics, work, migration, gender, and culture, and has revealed hitherto unsuspected streams of connection surging from maritime movement. Yet, as salt water has been historicized, it has really often been reduced to a surface across which ships move to connect terrestrial points. But what if, instead of treating the sea as a featureless substance serving human mobility, what if instead we paid attention to its natural conditions, as Michael Borgolta and Nicholas Jaspert have recently urged, or we incorporate insights from oceanography, as Ruthie Gertwagen proposes. I think that actually a new approach to medieval Mediterranean maritime mobility might emerge if we heed environmental historians' call 
to expand our human-centric view by encompassing the natural world, not as a stage for history, but as a participant in history. Now, I am not an environmental historian, and what I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon is not necessarily environmental history. But I do think that the way that environmental historians conceptualize the relationship between humans and the non-human natural world could be helpful to us. And they conceive of this relationship as what they call hybridity, by which they mean that the two are inextricably linked in a complex web of mutual influences. So we could look at one side of this web. We could explore, for example, the impact of medieval ships on the Mediterranean marine ecosystem, or of port development on coastal marine life, or of shipbuilding on the forests that supplied the timber. But we could also look at the other side. We could explore how the Mediterranean marine environment affected human maritime mobility. And that's what I want to do, or at least that is, I want to do a part of that for the period that I increasingly think of as the long high middle ages, from about 1,000 down into the 17th century. And I want to focus particularly on how this sea's multiple mobilities disrupted human maritime movement. And I want to do that because these moments particularly expose the sea's power and the human response to it. So the first thing to say here is that despite this glorious mosaic from San Marco, whoops, sorry, that's not a glorious mosaic. That, that is a glorious mosaic. That was, those were ships in the Indian Ocean maybe that Ibn Majid had captained. So despite this glorious mosaic from San Marco in the 12th century, which shows this ship really sailing on nothing, right? Medieval people experienced Mediterranean maritime mobility, not as this kind of frictionless displacement between terrestrial points, but instead as a prolonged interaction with what modern scientists call an extreme environment, which you can see how extreme the sea can be in this 14th century Florentine image of a typical day in the Mediterranean. Now, by extreme environment, scientists mean what one calls a habitat characterized by extreme conditions beyond the optimal development for humans. Extreme environments, which also include deserts and polar regions, starkly manifest the overwhelming, ineluctable power of non-human natural forces. The poles, of course, through cold, the deserts through heat, and the seas through water in motion. And that is actually suggested by one of the images which was used in the poster for this conference, the late 15th century image of the port of Perpignan, which really relies for its visual effectiveness, it really relies on the contrast between the static buildings and then the movement of the wind-whipped water. Wind and wave, tempest and tide, the sway of fishes and the play of light, the pull of currents and the drift of seaweed. The sea is never still. Now other aquatic environments like rivers and lakes are also in motion, but the scale and the force of marine motion dwarfs theirs. Marine currents says one oceanographer, are many thousand times more powerful than any river on land. Medieval seafarers recognized the sea's special restlessness. The waters of the sea are more rude, sonorous, and wondrous in their elevations than other waters, wrote the 15th century Dominican Felix Fabri, who had spent long months aboard Mediterranean ships. The sea was such a realm of movement that it could even dissolve the distinction between immobile and mobile. An 11th century Fatimid geographer described at how certain times a mosque would appear on the shore near Tunis and after people prayed there, it would disappear and sink back beneath the sea. 
Now, even medieval seafarers who didn't believe that the sea had the wondrous power to make the immobile mobile knew it as a living environment in ceaseless motion that had power over them. Whether you were in a small boat used for coastal trips or in a large ship plying deeper waters, like, for example, this uh, Venetian galley from the 15th century in a beautiful German manuscript illumination, or this Ottoman galley from a slightly later period, or whether you were crew or passenger, you would have been enveloped in what has been called the synesthetic experience of the sea, common to all pre-steam maritime voyages. And I think we can sense that better, we can sense it very well here, but better in this Ottoman um, plate of this ship in motion. So intense was the sensory experience of the sea's encompassing presence that medieval seafarers perhaps shared the sensation of some Tunisian fishermen today who describe themselves as not being at sea, as we would say in English, but as rather being in the sea. A medieval ship, in fact, moved towards its port as a partner in an intricate dance with the marine environment's own motion. And both of these images, I think, capture that very well. Vessels that used sail primarily are obviously dependent on the winds, but even a vessel that both has sail and then rowers, as in the case of these images, really has to reckon with marine motion with the tides, the currents, and the winds, because with their low freeboards, galleys were very easily swamped. Hence, the acute attention to natural signs that Ibn Majid recommended to mariners. They needed to be able to predict and respond to the sea's movements that determined those of the ship. And hence, the obsessive, obsessive detail about wave height and wind direction in medieval accounts of Mediterranean crossings. This seemingly tedious minutia, and anybody in the room who's read these accounts knows it can be very boring, and then the wind was from the west, and then it was from the east. It actually reveals how sensory awareness of the sea's immense power permeated the medieval experience of maritime mobility. In favorable conditions, you could have the exhilarating sensation of commanding this power. As the 11th century Andalusi Jewish poet and politician Shmuel Hanagid wrote, we worked the oars and a wind came up as over a field of corn, and the sea like a slave did as I asked like a maid, and the sky was sapphire. But the sea was never actually a slave to even the most skilled mariner because you did not control its waves and winds. Now this is true of all seas, but every sea has its own personality. And the Mediterranean was notoriously unruly and unpredictable. The 16th century Ottoman admiral, Piri Reis, contrasted the reliable, seasonal Indian Ocean winds with the capricious Mediterranean. No matter where the wind may be in the Mediterranean, he wrote, it will be inconstant. Sometimes it will deviate, and sometimes it will blow and take you on your way. Medieval seafarers' accounts confirm his observation about the fickle Mediterranean's power to disrupt human maritime mobility. Contrary winds could leave ships languishing in port for days, for weeks, for months. And at sea, favorable winds might suddenly shift, something that 16th century mariners setting out from Sardinia tried to avoid by checking a small ivory ship that hung and actually still hangs in the port city's Marian shrine. This little ship, which was an ex voto, infallibly indicated the direction of this, the wind on open seas, but it could not predict those moments when at sea the wind suddenly died, leaving the ship immobilized on glassy water or drifting on currents that could take it into enemy territory. 
No wonder then that it was on a becalmed ship that a 13th century Sufi supposedly composed the litany of the sea. This prayer, which was much used by Muslim voyagers by the 14th century, implores God to send us a gentle breeze. Let it bear us along as if by miraculous intervention. So becalmed Christians beseeched an array of maritime saints to dispel the sea's lassitude. Because in the doldrums, that is, when there's no wind, wrote Felix Fabry, people died of disease, dehydration, and starvation. The Mediterranean was indeed not just a particularly fickle sea, but also a particularly murderous one, at least according to a hadith quoted by medieval Muslim writers. God says to the Mediterranean and the Sea of Iraq, I have created you and I will entrust to you my faithful. How will you treat them? The Sea of Iraq says, I shall carry them. But the Mediterranean replies, I'll drown them. To medieval people, it seemed that the Mediterranean very often tried to drown them with storms. So back to our 14th century image here. Now, because of its geography, the Mediterranean rarely generates cyclonic storms of hurricane force, that is, so-called medicanes. But the Mediterranean was and is still a sea of storms, to borrow a phrase that Stuart Schwartz recently coined for the Caribbean. The underwater and terrestrial geography of certain areas particularly spawned storms. For example, the Gulf of Lyon. The Gulf of Lyon was named thus, wrote a medieval voyager, because a ship could cross the rest of the sea peacefully, but it could not cross here without great storms, danger, and fear. And oceanographers who look at both the underwater geography here and then the terrestrial geography explain why this is an area of particular storms. Now, our medieval writer who said this about the Gulf of Lyon, he lived in the 14th century, which is an era when, as paleotempestologists tell us, Mediterranean storms began to increase in frequency and fury as the Little Ice Age, whose beginning date is controversial, but it began to make itself felt. And so I wonder if those great changes in shipbuilding, ship design, that occurred in the high and late medieval Mediterranean, which have been described the causes for this in many ways, if there might not also be an element of them being a technological response to this climate change. However, we could say that even before this climate change of the 14th century, tempests roiled the Mediterranean, especially in the winter when winds shift and clash with the currents. Now, storms had even more impact on ships' movements than did the Mediterranean's inconstant winds. For example, successive storms drove a 14th century ship, which was traveling from Cyprus here to Venice, drove it first back to the coast of Asia Minor, then down to Tripoli, then to the island of Sapienza, and then finally allowed it to go to Venice. So medieval Mediterranean seafarers thus experienced maritime mobility, not as the neat linear progression from A to B that we tend to indicate with our maps. So here's a map of the voyage of the famous Andalusi 12th century pilgrim Ibn Jubair. They didn't experience it like this. Instead, they experienced it like those zigzags, right? They experienced it as a series of unplanned and involuntary zigzags caused by storms blowing them off course. Now, storms meant more to medieval seafarers than just thwarted or delayed movement. Almost every Mediterranean seafarer's narrative, whether Muslim, Jewish, or Christian, contains harrowing descriptions of tempests, of their mountainous waves, deafening thunder, blinding lightning, screaming wind, and churning water. These portrayals of an enraged marine environment unleashing vast and incomprehensible force are quite accurate. As a modern oceanographer explains, 
The largest, most violent storms on Earth are generated at sea. The energy released by a single tropical cyclone in one day would be enough to power the entire industrial output of the US for one year. Mediterranean marine storms were smaller scale, but they still subjected medieval mobile people to the most extreme and most terrifying weather events that they would ever experience. These destructive demonstrations of the sea's awesome power over humans made seafarers feel the Mediterranean as a willful presence, even as an animate force, as some personifications of some storm elements suggest. Christian mariners, for example, transformed the eerie electromagnetic phenomenon of blue flames that could ignite on masts during storms into the saintly, into saintly comforting presence. Mariners assured passengers that these fires manifested St. Elmo's protection and meant that the storm would soon pass. And modern scientists actually confirm pre-modern mariners' insight that corona discharge, which is what this is technically called, actually often occurs near a storm's end. But a storm's fury more often evoked supernatural malevolence. High medieval Christian artists painted demons into marine storms, as we see in this 14th century altarpiece from Dalmatia. And the Jewish Christian Testament of Solomon describes a seahorse demon who actually boasts of being the storm waves. And a 14th century Christian seafarer described his ship's traumatic encounter with a cursed spirit that we call Makone, which was probably a cyclonic storm. The men who knew the sea most intimately, that is mariners, believed more simply that storms, or at least they could believe this, that storms manifested the Mediterranean's own displeasure when humans asked it to do something intolerable. When a crusader's bones were loaded on a 12th century ship departing Cyprus, the crew protested that the sea would not bear a dead body, a corpse, without tempest, which proved to be true. Hence, when 15th century Christian pilgrims stipulated in their negotiations with a Mediterranean shipmaster that if any of them died while at sea, the body would be kept on board until the ship could get to land, the shipmaster replied, the sea would not suffer it, and thus our journey would be impeded. Mariners here are making the sea ventriloquize their own dread of corpses, which is a subject well worth exploring. But here I want to emphasize that it really was logical for sailors to read tempests as the sea's rebellion against humans. At their fiercest, storms smashed rudders and masts, tore sails, and left the ship helpless. But even without such damage, storms often took control of ships, despite the crew's skills. We let the ship go and do what it would, wrote a 14th century Franciscan of a storm off Tripoli. He described how people and cargo rolled across the deck as the ship lurched, he said, like a sick man who wants to walk but can't stay on his feet. The ship first fell on one side and then on the other and could not be controlled in any way. Storms thus exposed the emotional costs, the dangerous hubris, and the contingency of maritime mobility. They generated trauma that was the emotional counterpart to the thrilling audacity of humans venturing onto the back of the immense moving force that was the sea. Storms reminded seafarers of the reality that they were like worms clinging to a piece of wood, to borrow a metaphor for maritime voyages used first by Muslims and then by some Jewish writers. 
and echoed by the 12th century pilgrim, Ibn Jubair, who described November storms, he said, with waves like mountains that struck the ship such blows that with all its size, it tossed like a tender twig. Storms thus transform ships into emotional communities of fear. In the wake of a tempest, we all felt as if we had escaped the tomb. We were pale and jaundiced, and all this was because of fear, wrote a 14th century Franciscan. In this storm-engendered community of fear, individual interests were sacrificed to the collective interest in survival. And we can see this with what happens to property in a storm. A 12th century Jewish merchant from North Africa described how a storm off the coast of Jaffa drove us out into the middle of the sea where we remained for four days. We threw part of the cargo overboard and I gave up all hope not only for my life but also for my goods. The age-old practice of jettison lightened the ship. It also expressed hierarchies of worth in which property was weighed against human lives and even human lives against each other. Medieval Islamic jurists, for example, agreed that the heaviest goods should be jettisoned first, followed by the lighter ones, and then by animals. But they debated whether humans themselves could be jettisoned. Most said no, but some argued that to save Muslim lives, non-Muslim captives and slaves could be jettisoned. Other jurists instead proposed a kind of voluntary sacrifice, recommending that lots be drawn to see who would be tossed overboard. So a storm, a ship in a storm, was thus a collective of fear in which normal rules were suspended. Because this was a collective not only facing death, but actually collective accompanied by death, as you can see in this late 15th century manuscript from um, Venice, which shows death actually riding on the ship in a storm. The corpses of people swept overboard by the storm might even float by you, macabre proof of the sea's power over life and death as a 16th century Franciscan experienced off Crete, and of course, as you can see in this image here. Now crews deployed their skills, which could be considerable, to keep the ship afloat. But if the storm swelled to crisis proportions, even these men familiar with the Mediterranean's moods might join passengers in turning to the only force with power to still the enraged sea that is, its creator God and his saints. Storms really distilled the piety generated by maritime mobility. They reminded you that to embark on the sea was to commit yourself to God's hands. But this belief, which was shared by Muslims, Jews, and Christians, was really in tension with their evident recognition of the sea's power also over their fate. Every account that I have read of Mediterranean storms describes how mingled with the screams of terror was also the clamor of prayer. No wonder then that by the 15th century there was a Castilian proverb, if you want to learn to pray, go to sea. Now Muslims and Christians in a storm also vowed offerings to the saints and pilgrimage to their shrines, but other shipboard emergency devotional practices were more specific to the sea. Members of all three faiths wielded religious talismans to quell the water's movement. Christians tied relics to ropes and dragged them through the angry waves, while Jews tossed pottery inscribed with God's holy names into the stormy waters. And just so you can see what this pottery would have looked like, this is actually not inscribed with the runes against the sea, but um, you can see it's different magic formulae, but that's what one of these Jewish bowls would have looked like. And Muslims, too, confronted tempests with amulets. They cast into the seas offering of oil, candles, or dirt, from the tomb of Sidi Muhriz in Tunis, and you see a 19th century photograph of the tomb complex there. And mariners believed that this dirt from his tomb was particularly efficacious. 
Muslims also attached bits of cloth inscribed with saints' names high on the mast, reaching heavenward to gird this critical part of the ship with holy protection. Now there's much more to say about all of these practices, but what I want to underline here is that there's much, much evidence that all of this was happening often on the same ship. A 17th century Christian slave perhaps put it the most memorably. We, as I say, we have much evidence of this, but he really describes it beautifully, recalling what he calls a veritable last judgment as the Muslims, Christians, and Jews all aboard the ship of um, the Barbary pirates where he was laboring during a storm, how they all pled for heavenly help in their own ways. I've explored elsewhere how ships were thus potential agents of Mediterranean religious encounter and entanglement, not just because they moved people from one point to another across the sea, but because they brought people of different faiths together on the sea. Muslim and Jewish passengers traveled on Muslim ships and on Latin Christian ones, and Latin-owned ships were often crewed by Latin Christians, Greek Christians, Muslims, baptized Muslims, and the crews of North African and Ottoman ships included Muslims, Christians, and Christian converts to Islam. Whether or not Jews also worked as Crew members is debatable, but we know that also crews included men of murky or hybrid religious identities. So the existential angst that was provoked by marine storms, combined with this multi-confessional nature of Mediterranean maritime mobility to allow the sea to be drafted as a powerful player in religious polemics. The Palestinian Talmud describes a storm-tossed ship on which everybody prays to their own idol, but the waves abate only when a Jew prays to his God. And his shipmates, of course, admit his God's superiority. And this is a story echoed by ballads, mocking ballads sung centuries later by Sephardic Jews in diaspora about how people on a storm-tossed ship who pray to the Virgin Mary drowned, while those who pray to God alone are saved. Now these ballads proclaim Judaism's superiority and ridicule Christianity, while perhaps also warning any Jew who might be inclined to join Christians in invoking the Virgin Mary during storms at sea. Indeed, the acute religiosity which was generated by storms amplified and intensified the potential for shipboard religious entanglement. During life-threatening crises, observation of the other's devotional practices might shade into participation in them. In the dangerous waters of, off Cape Baba, Asia Minor, where sudden squalls from the mountains often buffeted ships, 16th century Christian mariners imitated and joined in with their Muslim peers by tossing into the sea propitiatory offerings and invoking the Muslim holy man who had lived on this promontory. The violent sea might even plunge people into anguish over their religious allegiance. A storm off Cyprus made a 16th century Portuguese conversa repent of her earlier decision to return to Judaism. Some months later, however, she reinterpreted her rescue, saying that God had saved her not because she had decided to go back and be a good Christian, but rather because she had always been a good Jew. Now, as Christian and Muslim authors recognized, vows made at sea very often went unfulfilled, especially once fear faded. But in medieval Christian and Islamic literature, marine tempests often impel a permanent romantic or heroic transformation of a protagonist. And in reality, the sea could spur life-changing religious transformation. Aboard this same ship with the Portuguese conversa was a Jewish man who kept the vow that he made to be baptized if he was saved from the storm. As this man and this woman wrestled with their religious decisions, 
they experience the ultimate power of the sea to disrupt maritime mobility and to change lives. And that was shipwreck. The storm rammed their ships onto the rocks somewhere between Paphos and Limassol, and you can see what the coast, this part of the Cypriot coast looks like. And there, large and powerfully built, though this Venetian ship was, it broke apart in the 14th century Italian image of shipwreck. Now, as far as I know, and I am very willing to be corrected on this and hope I'm wrong, but I think there has been no comprehensive study of Mediterranean shipwreck. And so I can't offer you any statistics. Most ships seem to have arrived intact at their destination, but a goodly number did not. Human error or incompetence or shoddy construction might be at fault. But very often, the rigors of the Mediterranean's marine environment simply strained ships beyond their limits. Storms could submerge or rupture a ship in open water, as is happening here. But often, it was violent encounters with the Mediterranean's limestone that wrecked ships. Whether in the shape of jagged coasts, we've already seen this one off Cyprus, or this is the island of Favignana, also well known for shipwreck. So rocks off the coast, or this sees abundant underwater hazards, which you can see off Lampedusa here, the underwater rocks here. And these underwater hazards of the Mediterranean were detailed by a 14th century oceanographer avant la lettre. He wrote, in the sea, there are mountains and rocks, grasses and vegetation. In some places, the rocks and mountains are covered by hardly a hand or arm's worth of water. So no one dares to sail in some places toward the south near Barbary because many rocks and shoals are there. The red coral that he describes being harvested along the North African coast, as we know it was elsewhere in the Mediterranean, too could rend an unwary ship's hull. Also stocking the ship were more mobile elements of the Mediterranean marine environment. Muslim, Christian, and Jewish seafarers described giant fish that wrecked ships by leaping on them or biting chunks from their hulls. Now, whether these were whales or sharks or tuna or simply mythic monsters recalling Jonah's biblical host, they embodied the Mediterranean's power to sink ships. And so here we see the Jonah story, 14th century manuscript from um, Iran, and the 15th century Kennecott Bible, and a late medieval Christian image here. Shipwreck haunted medieval Mediterranean seafarers as both a terrifying possibility and a physical reality. The remains of unlucky ships littered this sea, sometimes shockingly visible. In clear, shallow water, mariners might spy the bones of ships in the sea bottom, while on rocky points, they might glimpse rotting carcasses of vessels. Now, to modern archaeologists, such as these marine archaeologists exploring this wreck here. And full disclosure, this image actually comes from a river in northern Europe. Um, but I use it because I couldn't find a good one of a more or less intact medieval ship in the Mediterranean. This is a medieval ship here. So for archaeologists, these remains offer helpful data about trade routes, cargoes, and nautical technology. But to pre-modern seafarers, the site of shipwrecks here really exposed the fragility of the technology on which maritime mobility was based. They were warnings that, as Felix Fabry wrote, seafarers are never more than a forefinger width away from death, since that is the thickness of a ship's hull. Encounters with wrecked ships thus left crews uneasy and anxious. As a 17th century knight of Malta wrote, sighting the remains of a ship near a dangerous cape made everyone afraid, and we believed that at any instance we might suffer a similar terrible fate. We continuously beseeched heaven with a thousand prayers and a thousand vows. Now, sighting a ship underwater was both unlucky and dangerous. It indicated, of course, that you were in dangerous waters. But it also was unlucky and dangerous because such a vessel might pull you down to join it. 
According to a 16th century Spanish captive, Algerian corsairs believed that during the winter, a magical bronze ship prowled beneath the Mediterranean's stormy waters. And those ships sailing in a more orthodox fashion, that is ships sailing on top of the water, not underneath it, they needed to sight the underwater ship first because if they didn't, their ship would sink and all aboard would drown. Now there's another reason that sighting this magical ship was as ill-omened as was sighting shipwrecked. And that is because a ship underwater turns the world topsy-turvy. It reverses proper order. Indeed, whatever caused a vessel to crack asunder, as an egg would crack when a man presses it with his two hands, as an 11th century Jewish merchant wrote of the, the experience of Sirach. Shipwreck represents a rupture, not just of the ship's fabric, but also of order on many levels. And this is recognized by those medieval writers who use shipwreck as a metaphor. Shipwreck is a powerful metaphor, not just used in the Middle Ages, but down to today. Because shipwreck destroys the technology or the technological artifact that allows humans to survive in the extreme environment of the sea. So therefore, it can symbolize the collapse of other technologies that humans create to insulate themselves from nature. So technologies such as politics, as culture, society. Now, unless they're archaeologists, I think most medievalists to consider shipwreck really have confined themselves to its metaphoric and literary possibilities. And this has allowed modernists in many ways to make shipwreck their own, and even to proclaim shipwreck an emblem of modernity. But evidence from the pre-modern Mediterranean might help medievalists reclaim shipwreck and to understand how it affected not just metaphoric ruptures, but also very real ones. And this is evident if we consider the element of the marine environment that comes to the fore in shipwreck, and that is the shore. And here you see the shore off Almeria. Shipwreck rendered this ambivalent liminal space where the sea and land meet, a site of horror and of opportunity, as wave, tide, and current brought to shore the material and human flotsam from the vessel's broken body. Shipwrecks spilled rich cargoes into the Mediterranean that the sea then carried to places where they were not originally intended for. This could be God's will, as Christian hagiography suggests, with the topos of Marian images, like Santa Maria del Mar of Almeria here, or Candelaria of Tenerife, or many other images brought to the sea after shipwreck. And so in hagiography, the story is that these images fortuitously float ashore, and Santa Maria del Mar floated ashore on this shore right here. And their charisma remains intact despite their wave-damaged paint and wood. However, if shipwrecks could bring new sacred objects to a community in need of them, they also brought to shore more secular cargo that aroused less pious emotions and encouraged breaches of social and ethical norms. Many accounts of Mediterranean shipwreck describe a frenzy of greed as coastal dwellers rushed to seize what seemed to them like gifts from the sea, but actually belonged to somebody else. A shipwreck, for example, in the 1340s on Lampedusa even inspired a motley flotilla of little boats to set out from Sicily full of people eager to grab from Lampedusa's shores whatever they could. Now, the complex laws regulating seaside salvage articulated by Muslim and Christian polities were often largely ignored by scavengers who were intent on turning somebody else's tragedy into their own economic opportunity. They resisted, sometimes quite violently, any survivor who tried to assert property rights. Now, as shipwreck transformed the shore into the site of what one 16th century eyewitness called cruel theft 
and inhumane behavior. The horror was compounded by uncontested flotsam, and that is human bodies, corpses. The pre-modern Mediterranean really merited the title that the contemporary Mediterranean has earned during the migrant crisis of giant graveyard, giant watery cemetery. These are phrases you find used in the media quite often these days about the Mediterranean. And that is because shipwreck in the Middle Ages left the same tragic trail of bodies washed ashore as it does now. Islamic law and Christian duty mandated that locals bury beached bodies, but scavengers often ignored corpses. A 16th century Franciscan buried the dead on a beach from a wreck off Cyprus, but Felix Fabri had no luck persuading galley rowers on his ship to inter a body they found on shore. Perhaps stranded bodies were often left to rot, as this one was, because they inspired a particular horror in mariners. In shipwreck's aftermath, the sea might also bring to the shore living people, that is, survivors. And the best image I've found of this actually way post-states my period, but it is quite a striking one here, and is, I think, intentionally dark. It's by a French painter of the 18th century, and it's called Mediterranean Storm. And you can see the survivors small down here. Survivors were people cast up on a coast that they did not choose. Hence, in medieval Islamic and Christian literature, shipwreck is a convenient device to displace the protagonist. And because shipwreck often literally stripped people naked, as you can see in this painting, in literature, it could precipitate self-transformation or even rebirth. So in Ariosto's famous early 16th century epic, Orlando Furioso, Shipwreck on a Mediterranean islet converted a Muslim character to Christianity. Now, if the sea brought you to the right shore, shipwreck indeed offered the actual possibility of pos a positive transfer sorry, positive transformation of your circumstances. And this was especially true for enslaved people and captives. Slaves from ships that were wrecked on deserted islands took advantage of the pandemonium of screaming winds driving rain and their master's disarray to smash their chains and then to seek a hiding place in a limestone cave or the dense Mediterranean macchia as 16th century shipwrecked Muslim galley slaves did on Lampedusa and Christian slaves did on the Balearic island of Formentera. Now shipwreck that casts slaves and captives onto shores belonging not to deserted islands but shores belonging to their co-religionists were offered the chance not just for freedom but also for revenge. And this occurred in 1606, when three ships of the Knights of Malta collided while attempting a stormy nighttime passage through the dangerous waters off Cap Bon, which is here, uh, right there. The survivors who washed up on the island of Sembra, which is over here, included Muslim galley slaves who turned the tables on their masters by smashing their chains and building fires on the island's summit here to signal to Muslims on the mainland the presence of vulnerable Christian enemies. So Tunisian warships arrived the next day and a prolonged battle ensued. Now as all these episodes suggest, Shipwreck made the sea a player in the complex religiously inflected politics of the Mediterranean. But as this story about the island of Zembra also indicates, the Mediterranean's religious geography didn't always work in shipwreck's survivors' favor. If you worked, washed up on the wrong shore, which is what happened to the Knights of Malta in this episode, then you were very, very vulnerable. Vulnerability is, in fact, the hallmark of the shipwreck experience. 
And high medieval Christian literature often suggested this by depicting shipwreck victims as female. Like Boccaccio's famous Aletiel, the Sultan of Egypt's daughter whom shipwreck renders prey to Christian male sexual desire. Real shipwreck survivors were vulnerable to other people. People who might not just steal your possessions, but if you were of a different faith, take you captive. So 16th century Barbary corsairs shipwrecked off the Sicilian promontory of San Vito lo Capo were taken captive by local Christians, just as 17th century Christians shipwrecked on the North African coast were by Muslims living there. This link between shipwreck and captivity explains Ibn Jubair's gratitude when William II of Sicily not only sent boats out to rescue him and other Muslim passengers from shipwreck off Messina, but let them go free. If this fate had befallen us on the mainland, wrote Ibn Jubair, or even on one of the islands inhabited by the Rum, even if we had been saved, we would have been forever slaves. Religious difference could trigger an even worse fate than captivity for shipwreck survivors. Christians from Crete killed Turks shipwrecked on a deserted Aegean island. And we know about this, the story is told by a Florentine priest, Cristofero Bondelmonti, who sailed the Aegean in the early 15th century, and he turned the account of his voyages into what is one of the earliest, most famous of those texts that describe islands exclusively called Isolario. And um, so here we see an illumination from a 1480s manuscript of Bondelmonti showing us a deserted Aegean island. Bondelmonti also tells us about a sh Turks shipwrecked on another deserted Aegean island, cobbled together a raft and set off for home, only to be killed at sea by Christians. As Bondelmonti knew from personal experience, shipwreck could make you vulnerable to nature as well as to people. During Bondelmonti's Aegean voyage, he was shipwrecked in the then desolate and deserted Forni Islands. And there, he and his shipmates survived for a week with only wild plants to eat and water from hollows in the rock to drink. He marked the island with his despair, scratching a graffito with his sword point in a cave. Here, Cristoforo died from harsh hunger. Such experiences that reduced you to a state of nature could induce lasting trauma, as a 12th century Jewish merchant from North Africa recalled of the 20 days that he spent marooned on a deserted island between Sicily and Tunis, with, as he wrote, no food other than nettles. When we set out from there, we did not have the look of human beings anymore. After arrival in Sicily, we were so exhausted from our sufferings at sea that we were unable to eat bread or understand what was said to us for a month. Now the sight of this man's suffering was the same as that of Bondelmonte and of many other shipwreck survivors, and that is an island. And it is with islands that I want to end. Islands were the other element of the marine environment that composed the geography of Mediterranean shipwreck. Before the age of steam, shipwreck and islands were actually synonymous, says John Gillis, who's an island studies scholar. And that is because islands were very often fringed with rocks, as you can see in the 1480s manuscript illumination, or again, off Lampedusa here, and thus, this made them dangerous because the Mediterranean storms and unpredictable winds could drive ships onto these rocks. Therefore, in bad weather, ships steered clear of islands unless they were already anchored in a safe harbor there. The specter of shipwreck on deserted islands was particularly terrifying because it made you nature's prey. 
Now, the literary opportunity the deserted islands thus offered as the setting where the marooned hero might literally reinvent civilization was realized by the 12th century Andalusi writer Ibn Tufail centuries before Daniel Defoe wrote Robinson Crusoe. But men of the sea could have a more practical response to the threat of shipwreck on a deserted island. On what was perhaps the Mediterranean's most remote deserted island, that is Lampedusa, by the 16th century, Muslim and Christian mariners together created a stockpile of food, clothes, and tools. This was intended to help any mariner, whether Muslim or Christian, free man or enslaved person, any of them who are marooned on this deserted island, this was intended to help them survive until they, until they could hail a passing ship of their own faith. Now presiding over this cache were sacred figures because these supplies were kept in a cave shrine. A word about this image which I took, the cave shrine was in a very the, uh, tiny valley at the end of a narrow bay on Lampedusa. It's, very, it's not entirely clear because there's been no archeological work where the shrine actually was. There are a couple of caves in this valley, including a chapel. It may be where the chapel is now, but if it isn't in this cave, it's in one that was two feet away and looked exactly the same. So this can stand in for our cave here. Now this cave shrine harbored an image of the Virgin Mary and also the tomb of a Muslim holy man. And these were very good choices for a mariner's shrine. Because Mary was, of course, a woman venerated by both Muslims and Christians. So here we have a Christian image of the Annunciation from the 15th century. Very beautiful one. I always love this one with the peacock feathers. And then um, a very beautiful and equally beautiful 16th century Persian image of the Annunciation. And Mary, by the high medieval and early modern period, was really among the most popular maritime saints among Christians. And so we see that here. This is an iconic image from early 16th century Seville, which shows Mary as the patron of the ship sailing the Atlantic, and a much less known image, undated, I think, from the 17th century of Our Lady of Lampedusa as the patron of the ships going there. And if the Muslim holy man, venerated in the tomb there, resembled his peers, he was an equally appropriate patron for a mariner's shrine, because this really was a mariner's shrine. Nobody else went to Lampedusa but mariners in this period. According to Muslim seafarers and some Christian ones, Muslim holy men controlled the sea's winds and waves, powers they wielded in life and after death. And the best image I could find of this is extremely contemporary. It's from the 20th century, but it is a depiction of an episode with which both Muslims and Christians believed by the 16th century to have happened. And that is when Charles V's fleet laid siege to Algiers in 1541, some local marabouts went out in a ship and they stirred up the seas with their staff, which created a storm which sank Charles V's fleet and therefore saved Algiers. And there's, there's lots of other evidence besides this 20th century print of this going all the way back into the 15th century, of uh, 13th century even, of Muslim holy men controlling the winds and waves and drowning Christian ships. However, despite the patronage of these two marine holy figures, the true guardian ensuring that the supplies were there in Lampedusa's shrine for seafarers in need was the island's marine environment itself. According to Mariner's lore, the sea enforced the protective taboos with which this shrine was hedged. Mariners knew that if you came to Lampedusa, and you made no offerings at the shrine, or that you took something without leaving something of equivalent value, you'd be unable to sail away, your ship immobilized by the sea or lashed by tempest. Now, tales circulated of Muslim and Christian mariners and Jewish passengers who tested this prohibition and were duly punished by wind and wave. These stories' warning power was doubtless enhanced by mariners' knowledge that Lampedusa, with its hidden reefs, strong currents, 
and variable winds had wrecked many ships. So just to remind you that it still does that today. Lampedusa is also known for variable winds that can leave ships stuck on the island for months at a time, at least in the 16th and 17th centuries. Lampedusa's shrine is further evidence of how, as we have seen, Muslim Christians and Jews responded to the restless sea with religious practices and stories in which the play of mobile and immobile created a shared Mediterranean maritime supernatural. Lampedusa also suggests that the sense of the Mediterranean as living presence was perhaps most particularly pronounced among men like those who created Lampedusa's shrine, that is mariners, men whose lives depended on their deep understanding of and profound respect for the dangerous, unpredictable force that was the sea. But as we have seen, the sea's power was palpable even to passengers venturing on its back for the first time, and so now should it be to us. We've seen how the Mediterranean could delay or thwart human maritime movement, the sea also precipitated hitherto unsuspected shipboard emotional communities and existential crises. The marine environment's impact on maritime mobility also sent waves to the shore as shipwreck redistributed sacred and secular property. And the sea's own multiple mobilities intersected with this region's multi-confessional nature to create religious entanglement to draw new lines of religious allegiance or to sharpen old ones. And finally, this sea could also change mobile people's lives permanently for the better or for the worse, releasing them into freedom or plunging them into captivity or even death. The human maritime mobility and the marine environment thus formed a complex and potent nexus of which I have only explored one tiny corner here. But I want to end by saying that understanding the sea as active presence rather than as passive background not only suggests new interpretations of medieval Mediterranean movement, but it also restores to its rightful place in history the sea, a force that is literally reshaping our world today as its rising waters engulf shores and communities and create migrants thousands of whom then entrust their lives to the same sea that commanded the fate of so many mobile medieval people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, for this uh, excellent, inspiring, and I would say, uh, of course, at the same time, through the contemporary reality of Lampedusa and uh, the Mediterranean migrants, necessarily engage a uh, lecture uh, on this in motion, but at the, set, uh, at the same time emotion or emotional restless Mediterranean. So no uh, microphones are open. It is time for, for the floor. Uh, you mentioned the sea from, and your theme was the restlessness of the sea. Are you going to also uh, engage the calmness of the sea? Because there was, you know, ample fishermen, ample uh, small trade route, where the coastal shelf, like the Balearics and stuff, fell off. I mean, you have the livelihood of the sea. Absolutely. And you've got, uh, you know, a, a counter image uh, that. Uh, and then I was a little bit surprised that you didn't bring in the piracy. You know, trade by day and pirate by night, they're the same people. Uh, but when you say about scrounging from shipwreck, it didn't have to be a shipwreck. You could wreck a ship. True, there are wreckers, absolutely. Yep. So, so thanks for that question. Um, Basically, in this talk, I was trying to do a very specific thing. I recognize the sea can be calm, that there's all kinds of cabotage, that there are fishermen, but they all have to reckon with the power of the sea. And so what I really wanted to do in this talk is to remind us of something that I think we're increasingly aware of, but not quite yet enough, 
that the sea really is this living force that is determining a lot of human relationships with it. So the calm sea, I think the most impressive calm sea is of course when the, the wind goes away, which I talked about, because that is also when you feel the power of the marine environment. But there's absolutely all kinds of less dramatic environmental interactions. So those absolutely exist, absolutely. I, um, Can you s please, your name and affiliation. Oh, uh, my name is Michael Hammer. I'm from San Francisco State University. I was uh, in, in, intrigued. You, you paint such a harrowing picture of travel by sea that uh, one wonders why pe people bothered in the first place. <laughs> and I wonder if you, I mean, I, I suppose the answer is obvious, but why would people choose to travel by sea instead of by land? Yeah, I was hoping it wouldn't come off as too heroic. I just told, taught a whole graduate seminar called Seascapes of History in which we read a books not having to do with the Middle Ages, but of really trying to understand how historians have conceptualized the relationship between people and the sea. And one of the things we concluded at the end is that we kind of, the what had emerged was a kind of romantic view of the sea, which I hope was not here, but apparently if I pictured, depicted heroes, then it was. Um, Obviously, people venture on the sea because it is still shorter, obviously, to get by sea. You can carry more stuff with less energy um, output. So there are all kinds of reasons that people travel by the sea. Cabotage, it's a lot easier to load stuff on your little ship than it is to find some mule or ox or horse that can carry the equivalent weight. So there are all kinds of good reasons for people to brave these dangers. And I wasn't trying to make the point that every single moment of a Mediterranean trip is like this. But it is true that when you read the accounts of Mediterranean voyages, I rarely read one in which there isn't a description of at least two or three life-threatening events. And so I wanted to draw our attention to those because we do so often just talk blithely about, and then they went from Tripoli to you know Barcelona or whatever. And we don't take account what's in the middle and if we think about how much anthropologists have told us that what's in the middle is really important. So I wanted us to do that. Uh, thank you. My name is Hisuk Lee Ninyoya. I'm independent. I'm working at ECOMOS. Uh, thank you for the very good lecture. Uh, it reminds me of kamikaze when Mongol wants to invade Japan. The guard made win and then they could not go. It reminds a tsunami in Indonesia. When I was in Indonesia, uh, the many Muslims think this class breath because there's so much Islam uh, disbelief. So coming back to your uh, paper in Mediterranean 15 centuries and Indian Ocean 15 centuries, it came to my mind. The Indian Ocean 15 centuries, there was Islamization. Uh, the first, uh, there was uh, Islamic uh, religion. Uh, religion went to the Indonesia or India or Maldives and we had to wait a monsoon. So we are very submitted to the nature, to the nature. And then after that, the Portuguese came and they want to evangelize, whatever. It was not a war between the religion. They want to disseminate the religion. However, 15th century Mediterranean, it was very much a war between. So it came to my mind whether this was God's rest <laughs> or we should live think in that specific time whether there was a certain, because you mentioned about the environment, the human being, that was it my thought. Yeah, so there's been interesting work on the Bay of Bengal called Nature's Fury, the um, fortunes of migrants, and I can't remember the entire title, but so it talks a lot about the, this change in the Indian Ocean that you talked about from sort of what, what is going on in the earlier period and then when the Europeans arrive. Um, but one thing, I think your contrast between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean in terms of what is going on there is very important. And Muslims in the Middle Ages, they conceived of the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean is very different, right? Because the Mediterranean was the space of jihad, was, was really the Dar al-Harb, whereas the Indian Ocean is a space of conversion and also of marvels. There are many more marvels that they describe in the Indian Ocean. So they're very aware of these different personalities. Um, 
Thank you. This is, thank you for an amazing talk. This is really interesting. I, one question I had was, um, you you mentioned briefly the sort of, you know, the evidence that as um, as we get into the little ice age, that there's sort of a greater instance of storminess um, in in various various oceans, including the Mediterranean. Um, and so, first of all, I I'm curious as to how how you would you would go about thinking about, given that you quite rightly pointed out that you know storms are always a risk, they're sort of a constant risk that we and that, medie that we as historians and that medieval people were thinking about even before the Little Ice Age. Then how do we incorporate the idea that there that that risk actually the the level of that risk changes over time, you know, and how do how do we sort of think about the idea that this these things are becoming might be becoming more common is my first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, do you, do you see any evidence that, in fact, um, people of the late Middle Ages and early modern periods were perceiving um, storms as getting more common? Um, is that at all present in your records? So the second part of the question first, which was as I was doing this, I thought, oh, I don't really have time to research that part. I hope nobody asks that question. Um, <laughs> but it's a really, because this is actually my Lampedusa project. This is kind of a sideline to my Lampedusa project. Um, but I think it's a really great question, and it would be a really great subject to really trace, like, is there increased incidence of descriptions of these storms? Like, if you looked at the 14th and 15th century ones, would they look different from an account of Ibn Jubair, et cetera? Certainly not when they describe the, the fury of the storm, th that seems very similar. But it would be a great question to find out if they do really, if you could track it. Now, part of the answer would be yes, because the paleotempestologists, which is a word I wanted to say again, because um, it's such a great word, some of the evidence that the paleotempestologists are using is not only um, data from the physical and natural world, but they're also looking at chronicles as corroborations. Okay, we find that in X chronicle, they describe five storm events in this 100-year period. Um, so they are using some of that narrative evidence. So one could actually use some of their articles to then go back and do the more historical work, but I can't answer it myself. In terms of how else we could understand this, I think one of the things would be nautical technology, which is not at all my field, and I know there are people here who that is their field. I think it would be really interesting to think about some of these changes in shipbuilding, which have many, many, many causes in the later Middle Ages, but could one of them be that the sea is becoming more furious, more intense? So that'd be one thing I would think about. I would also think about if you have greater incidence of shipwreck, right, then you have greater incidence of um, people being taken captive, you have greater incidence of goods being moved involuntarily around the Mediterranean. And if we get off into other things too, if we have more storms, we might have more water in the Mediterranean, which then makes for a very different Mediterranean geography of where ships stop, because ships are often stopping where they can get water. All of those of us who saw the, you know, the great galley in the, Medi in the, the Maritime Museum, those guys need water all the time. And so if there's more water on islands, islands become more useful um, and can actually allow more piracy to get back to the piracy question because the pirates have more places they can stop for water. So I think there are a lot of possibilities for how we could think about climate change as potentially having an effect. Now that would all rely on the paleotempestologists being right. Um, and that I'm not entirely qualified to judge. But so we would need, we would need more people with better scientific background. But I think it would be a really interesting thing to follow up on. Yeah, hi, I have a question. Thank you very much for, for your talk. So, Noria, where are you? Yeah, name. Okay, sorry, Noria. <laughs> I, I recognize the voice. Sorry, but. Noria Sigueras. I, I, thank you very much. So I have a question. You were describing an emotional community of people praying together, being afraid together. And I think that maybe like in the 14th century, we see insurance being very common. So do you see something changing when all of a sudden merchants, you know, had insurance for their cargo, their boats? I mean, is that a different uh, community? How did that work? Oh, that's a great question. I hadn't thought about it, but I will. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, uh, Roby Clark Patrick here. Um, I, I really liked the uh, connection 
with um, thinking of deserts and sort of the polar and um, it was making me, and I was thinking also about the idea of water and oasis. Um, and it was, and I was thinking about the mapping, like you said, and how the mapping is drawn. And one, should we be reconsidering our ideas of even travel on land based off of oasis and, um, and these sort of concepts in that we simplify often travel across deserts and such. Um, where that, and maybe be thinking more of islands um, when it comes to desert crossings or other extreme places. And then second, um, how can, I, I, I feel like in border studies to a degree, there's been uh, concepts of looking at, at least in the medieval period, as cities and populated areas as islands in seas of land. Um, and so I, I guess I just would like ask how you think that we can trouble our thinking about land and oceans and seas by via these ideas about taking serious and looking at the, um, the way crossings of the ocean or seas are complicated um, by that natural space. Yeah, that's a really interesting and great question. There's a big debate in island studies people about what word we should use to talk about what I always describe as islandness. And there are some historians who want to call it insularity, but they don't like that because of the implications that has in English. So there's an endless debate about this, but part of the debate is between people who want to keep the concept of island limited to a body of land, however big or small, surrounded by water, and other people who say, as you're suggesting, that the concept of island can be really useful for us understanding insularity in terrestrial forms. So there's actually a whole branch of island studies that takes that concept and applies it to land, and I think can be really, really interesting. A good introduction to that is um, Nicholas Jaspert has a co-edited volume called something about Mediterranean islands. I can't remember the title of it. But he poses some of those theoretical issues there, and he falls on the side if he doesn't want to use words like islandness. Um, I don't agree with Nicholas, but that's OK. Uh, so that's a very good place to look. And then in terms of thinking about deserts, I think definitely we could take some of these ideas about the environment shaping human movement and talk about the desert. But in doing that, I think we always have to remember, and this was one of the big debates that my students and I had in this seminar, is is there something particular about the sea? And I think that even though the desert is an extreme environment, if you fall off your camel, you won't necessarily die. But today, if you're on one of those sailboat races and you fall off, you basically die even today. So in the Middle Ages, even though I think more people could swim than we think they could, because I find more evidence in my documents of people who can swim, um, there's still something different about the water because you cannot, it's like space, you cannot survive in the water without some technological artifact around you. So I think we should always remember the particularity of each environment because the desert would have its own particularities. Uh, but I definitely think the concept of island we could expand it and use it in all kinds of interesting ways. Uh, thank you very much for a very, very interesting lecture. And um, I, I was very persuaded by what Name you said. Name and affiliation, please. So, sorry? Name and affiliation, please. Ah, sorry. Um, I'm Francesca Patrizzo. I'm a Leverhulme. Um, study abroad scholar at Rome Tor Vergata. Um, and I was thinking, so you gave us, I, I thought, a very thorough picture of how we often ignore the physicality and the danger of saying, you know, we took ship at Messina and we landed at Tripoli and that's a that's journey. Um, but I was wondering um, if you had also looked um, conversely as at sea voyages as the less traumatic alternative to land voyages. And I look um, a lot at the Crusades and sort of generalizing, but in the early Crusades, you very often have very traumatic overland voyages. And then they look for the sea as an alternative that is not necessarily perfect, but seems at least in the sources to be less traumatic. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think the way that I would frame it is that on land, your main dangers are from other people, as well as, you know, deserts or mountains or snowstorms. 
but that on the sea, your main danger is from nature. And so it's a trade-off between those two. And as we know, it's mostly humans that we are more dangerous than almost anything we can think of, right? So, so I think that that's, they would be different kinds of dangers that you're facing and different kinds of trade-offs. But there's also the length of time that I think also factors into this, right? Overland travel is much slower in the end, despite all the delays that there can be on the sea. We are a little bit uh, late. Uh, can you? Yes, my question is very short. Yeah, try to be short. Uh, please. My name is Lucas Villegas from Queen's University. I just want a question about Lamp the Lampedusa Shrine. When is the earliest uh, mention of this shrine? The earliest mention that I have of the actual shrine comes from the mid 16th century in the form that I'm describing it. But Louis IX in 1254 stops off on the island of Lampedusa, describes it as inhabited, or Joinville describes it as only inhabited by rabbits. And what Joinville describes is what may be some primitive nucleus of the shrine, which he describes as a double vaulted area and a red clay cross under one vault and then two bodies which he describes as being buried in a way that could be either Islamic or Christian being there. So is this, is this what is then transformed later into the shrine? But the actual first references I have to the shrine itself are mid 16th century. There is a very intriguing reference in a uh, Catalan prophecy from the 1470s that intriguingly mentions um, the hermit of Lampoza, La Lampoza, as being an island off Sicily. So there was some hermit there in the 15th century. I can't say more about him, possibly her, probably him. Um, I can't say more about him at this point. So I was very intrigued uh, by your uh, quote that you used from uh, Shmuel Hanagid describing the, uh, the more kind of submissive sea mm -hmm. as being almost like this enslaved woman. And I was wondering if uh, there are examples as well of the sea as being kind of gendered as feminine or how that works when the sea is presented as violent and inconstant mm -hmm. and what that kind of gendered anthropomorphization tends to look like. Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I haven't given it enough thought to be able to answer that question, but that, like Nuria's question, is an excellent one that would be worth pursuing. <laughs> you were asking? No? Oh, okay, that's okay. No more? Okay. Uh, who's Miguel? Anyone more? Wants, uh, that's time for just one more. Yeah, yeah, no, no, after him. So we close after him. Thank you. Uh, uh, for, uh, congratulations for a br brilliant name. lecture. My name is Luis Miguel. I'm from uh, the University of Porto. Just two notes. Uh, when I studied uh, Portuguese expansion, a very good teacher I had used to say the difference uh, between uh, going to the, the Atlantic, the exploration of the African uh, western coast and the, the travels to Mediterranean was that uh, you always knew that you came home from Mediterranean, but uh, uh, when you went to Atlantic, you didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, he still is a very good teacher, but the idea is absolutely wrong, I, I realize. And, um, uh, um, the, the, the importance of uh, env environmental history. Um, I, I tried to study the, the Portuguese uh, presence in Morocco, and, and when you go there, it's not the same thing. Uh, Ceuta is, is not, the Ceuta we see is not Ceuta they saw. There were lots of mountains and, uh, and, and uh, forests, mm -hmm. and you, you can see a tree, and the, the, the high, uh, the, the waters are, are, are different. And so in Adzila, you, you saw lots of rocks. They are not there anymore. Tangier is a, a beautiful beach. So th the things in, in five centuries changed completely. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point for us all to consider, which we can tell in Barcelona. 
right? Where the shipyards are today is not where the sea was then. So that's one thing that we all need to be aware of and that I've become constantly aware of in my work is that the sea, the environment has changed. I mean, the, the coastline of Lampedusa is not the same coastline that it had in the 16th century. So this, I think, is a really important point. And a lot of this has been human activity. Um, we can think of coral fishing, which depleted the coral banks and all kinds of things. So I think that's a really good observation. The very last short question, please. Um, uh, I had the same impression as some of the um, other um, audience members that you gave a very um, pessimistic view of <laughs> sea travel. I do. Um, however, when I saw the painting of the survivals of a shipwreck, there was a lighthouse, and I think it, it's important because while the sea might be unruling, humans find their own ways to help themselves. And I was wondering if you are going to take this into consideration. And the yeah, I think that's, that's also a really interesting point. There's a whole system of lighthouses which are maintained often interestingly by monastics on the Christian side. Um, so humans do all kinds of things. And some of these maritime shrines, and Jessica, wherever she is, knows more about this than I do, um, they actually maintain lights that are there quite deliberately and are described as miraculous lights, which are always, you know, always shining at night to guide the mariners. So certainly, humans find all kinds of ways of coping with the sea um, and trying to tame it. And of course, today we have tamed the sea and we're busy wrecking the sea. So, so there's all kinds of ways and that humans did have that impact then. So I always do give a rather pessimistic per picture and I think that's to counterbalance the kind of San Marco, you know, you just fly across the sea. Uh, but humans do have all kinds of ways. And I think Lampedusa, my work on that, is really talking about how that island and the shrine is one of the ways that mariners have of meeting the demands of the marine environment and trying to make a, a, a safe space for human beings there. So it's, it's also a very important point. Well, thank you very much to the speaker and to all of you. Mm -hmm. And we, we are a few minutes late, but we will begin the next session on time at 4 uh, p.m. But before the coffee break, please, as everybody is, or almost everybody is here, a remark, some practical information on this evening optional activity. For those participating, Remember that we have to meet at Plaza del Rey, behind the cathedral, uh, in the monument, uh, kind of a cube iron sculpture, at 6 p.m. Be please on time. If you prefer uh, to uh, leave all of us together, some of the organization uh, members will be downstairs. Marta, I don't know if she's here. Well, we will follow uh, especially Marta, but we will leave at a quarter to six downstairs. And please uh, be sure, try to be on time, and be sure that you have uh, with you your badge and uh, in case uh, your tickets. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>